Hello, Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. This has been a guest, a friend. This has been a guest who arguably I've been wanting to get on uh, for about like two years now. And good guy, Rich Valdez. He is host of This America. He's also a producer over at Life, Liberty, and Levin. Rich Valdez, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? What's up, Tom? Great to be with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure. It's been too long since we've connected. Agreed. So, so what 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 I like now, what I love about Rich is, and, and we may not even agree on like all politics, but what I like is you can have a discussion, Rich. It could be meaningful. You can have a, have an active disagreement, but you still can be friends, right? On top yep. of that, on top of that, um, he's in a you know he's in a blue state. You, your vi uh, video cut out, Rich, but we'll continue. Um, yeah. You know, he, he, we're in a blue state in New Jersey. Uh, he is, you know, Latin American, which historically, you know, has been. Um, and I want to talk about that. It kind of gets heat for that or not as maybe as much. But I remember when he first started voicing opinion about Governor Christie, because I've been following him for years. And I do want to talk about that because I don't believe in identity politics. And then lastly, what I'm going to focus on is and a new theory. We talk to anybody that we want to talk to and we want to hear anybody's point of view that we think is meaningful. And I think the crust is going to be where does a conservative party and movement go? So, Rich, welcome to New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, your audio cut out. You you hit you hit the uh, you hit the mute button, buddy. Boom! How about that? Are there you back? go. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, brother. Thank God. All right. So, I want to trace first back your your roots in terms of politics. So I know you were hooked up with Christie. Kind of go through that, and then how did that sure. how did that progress along? So for me, it all started back, you know, I've, I've been a small business owner for a long time. I had a uh, barber shop. That's how I got in the game with anything. You know, when I was 16, my brother made a loan to me and uh, helped me start a barber shop that I was like, I can't believe you're willing to put this money into me because I'm still in high school. I was Love in my it. senior year of high school. And Love he was it. like, listen, you could do it. You could do it after school. We'll build it slow. He found a salon that was going out of business. It had the equipment. The lease was there. So uh, eventually I ended up transferring out of my senior year of high school during the daytime and going to high school at night to finish high school and then going to um, barber school during the day. And I did that. And I got into business and I made a little money and I said, you know what, I'm going to get into the cell phone business. I had a buddy of mine from high school that was in the cell phone business. And he said, you know what, there, this is huge. It's blowing up right now. And I did. I got into the cell phone business and, you know, I, I made a little money. I lost some money. But the bottom line was I was in West New York, New Jersey, and the local politicians would come by and they had different programs for small business owners. And there was a lot of outreach. So you start to get involved. And I started to realize, you know, it doesn't matter what your politics are. Politics is a part of business. Correct. And when you're in business, whatever you're doing, there's going to be a, an impact somehow politically. Yes. So I said, OK, no problem. You know, I, I started to get involved. I saw what was going on and I just had my own natural inclinations as a barber. I liked making money. I realized, look, I stood there all day. I would work 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. As, again, as a teenager, I was still a teenager. I was only 19 at this time. Yeah. And I realized, you know what? Uh, I don't like having to pay you or anybody else, Uncle Sam in particular, uh, taxes. Yeah. I don't like this idea. you know. And when you're a small business owner at the, at the time, I believe the rate was 39% of what I was making was going back into the government. Yeah. And I said, man, this isn't cool. So you know, it's like $3.90 out of every $10 I make is not mine. Yeah. And I didn't like it. So I naturally gravitated toward the um, Republican Party because okay. they were always talking about cutting taxes. Now, they didn't yeah. always do it, but they did. So I, I was, you know, naturally, or I guess life made me into a fiscal conservative. Then you couple that with my upbringing as uh, my parents are born on the island of Puerto Rico. I was born in Brooklyn, moved over to Jersey when I was 12. And I realized, you know, there were so many things about our culture that are naturally conservative. We just, you know, we go to church on Sundays, no. we pray, we, and it's a big part. Italians are very much the same way, yeah. you know what I mean? Correct, correct. Yeah, you don't have a holiday. Having a holiday correct. is like having mass sometimes, right? You yep. have all these people, it, it's, it, there's, a, there's always prayer. So I think to myself, you know, it, to me, it was a natural fit. Now, again, may not have been that way historically, but, you know, in the election of George W. Bush in 2000 and 2004, there was a strong emphasis on evangelical Christians. Yeah. So, you know, I was a church goer. I, uh, I actually uh, was a volunteer with the Bush campaign, worked on the campaign in New Hampshire in 2004. So I've become more politically active as, as I got you know, older into my you know, early 20s. 
And so being in small business, getting involved with that, I also uh, interned for um, Congressman Scott Garrett, who at the time yeah. in New Jersey's fifth district, he was the most conservative member of Congress. And I didn't know that. And it wasn't why I went there. Yeah. It was just simply because I, I agreed with his positions on most issues. Uh, so because of that, it, to me, it seemed like a natural fit. And people did begin to, you know, come at me saying, but how could you do it? How could you be a Boricua Latino and, and, and support Republicans? And yeah. I thought, how could you not? Yeah. How how could you ever align with the party of, uh, you know, tax and spend liberalism? It doesn't match any of my values as a Hispanic, as a Latino, and overall as yeah. an American. Yeah. So so there's a lot to, lot to unpack there. So I, I, I agree with you in terms of, if you look at the core tenets of, of like maybe ethnicity, background, culture, and, and this is this is documented that the Italian culture, Italian American culture, Hispanic culture, Latin culture, you know, historically Catholic, um, uh, you know, if you're a Catholic, you, you know, you are, you know, theoretically pro-life and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, you know, about family values, that kind of stuff. So, and I, and I think on both sides, there's, there's been some, some loosening. We could talk about that. So, 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 so you lean towards, um, uh, obviously, um, and, and, and just to give some color folks for, for your younger people, there was a nice run with the Republicans, you know, contract with America, it swung right back in 96. There was kind of, you know, I know there was a Clinton bopping around, but aside from Clinton, there really was a tenant. There really was uh, an appetite uh, to kind of go back right a little bit like we saw from 16 <laughs> to 19. Uh, yeah. So, you know, history repeats itself, right? So, so my, my one question is, and, and you were always vocal when you worked with Christie, or at least uh, 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 were shared his views and that kind of stuff. And he was a Republican in, in, in a blue state and you got a lot of shit for it. I never understood. And you kind of touched on it. Why can't you be Republican? Like, I, like I'm missing, like, like to me, that's racist yeah. to me. That's, yeah, that's of course. classist. You know? Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, you know, Chris Christie's a great example. A lot yeah. of people disagree with him and, and there's times where I disagree yeah. with him as well. But one thing I could say is that I think he was a g really good governor. He brought a lot of things that brought a lot of value to the state of New Jersey. You're talking about a 2% constitutional amendment that said there's a 2% property tax cap in New Jersey. That was huge. Yeah. Uh, some people take exception to the fact that now public employees, teachers included, have to contribute 1.5% of their salary to cover their medical benefits. But yeah. again, I was a guy, I came in, you know, so again, I worked in, in my own business and then I went into corporate America and I worked yeah. there for a while, moved into higher education as a manager and doing marketing and stuff like that. And it was from there where uh, the Christie campaign needed some help with higher education. And it wasn't really anything huge, yeah. but I helped them out. And then when they got in, they they needed some uh, different people to join the administration. And I interviewed for a couple of different jobs and ended up landing with um, a role with the New Jersey State Department of um, Children and Families and oh, nice. worked on something called the Family Success Centers. And what I liked about it was the idea behind these were you know, everybody labeled Christie some sort of evil tyrant because he was slashing social programs, after yeah. school programs, all sorts of programs. Yeah. And nobody wants to do that. But it became a situation where we had way more debt than we had income. And he was trying to balance the budget. And he did yeah. every yeah. single year, except for the one year where the Democrats played hardball and we had a government shutdown. And eventually he won again. Yeah. So I think delivering a balanced budget Every single year that you're in office is a is a key part of being a good governor. And we had to do that. And the program that I was in charge of in northern New Jersey, to me, was great because it was really built on the premise of if you give someone a fish, they eat for a day. If you teach someone how to fish, they eat for a lifetime. Correct, and that's what correct. we did in these family <laughs> success centers. They were not designed to, to put anybody into any particular group other than you know, whatever it is, you could be a business owner that owns a small media company that's growing. You could be a salesperson. You could be a radio person. You could be a lawyer. You could be a homeless person. Mm -hmm. what, right. it, it wasn't designed on your income. It was based on what are your goals with your family in this community. So it could be in Alpine, New Jersey, or it could have been in Newark, New Jersey. And we had them all over. And that was the goal was to really strengthen families, strengthen communities, because the idea was the government's here to support you if you want the support, but we're not here to tell you what to do. Which which makes sense. Italians say eat the eat the eggs, not the chicken. Okay, so now let's go over to sixteen. So there's twelve candidates beginning of the 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 campaign series. They're all on stage. Who are you backing early? Yes. 
early in the campaign. And to be honest, Rich, don't say Trump right away. No, no, no. I, I, hold on really quick. Absolutely. I have a clip. Hold on. I have a clip from I was on TV. I predicted Trump was going to win the nomination. So I'll share that with you. I know cool. you get a good laugh, but give me, give me, who, who'd you, who'd you put your chips on back then? So, you know, honestly, I typically try not to jump on with anybody in a primary, okay. but I did favor, uh, again, ideologically, Ted Cruz is like a rock star. You know, he and I, I think, see eye to eye on so many things. Yeah. Uh, but I also liked Marco Rubio's delivery. I and I thought, you. you know, he, he was, um, I liked the way he delivered it, but sometimes I felt he was too centrist, where he was too willing to capitulate on his values and, and yeah. work with the other side. You need that in, in government. You absolutely need it. Yeah. But sometimes you, you need the other side as well, where you're just like, you know what, I'm not going to uh, fall back on this one. We're going to have to negotiate somewhere else because this means too much. But it didn't take long for Trump to come into the scene and really make his mark. I right. remember, and the way I saw it, literally, like the way I envisioned it when I was watching the debate, and it might have been the third debate, there was 15 people plus Trump. And it, to me, it looked like a line of people, almost like, you know, when you would knock down dominoes. And, <laughs> and I felt like each and every one of these people that I revered, like, listen, I, I helped start a charter school in Jersey City. Nice. And uh, education policy is a big part of my background. I, nice. I've always been a school choice advocate. And let me tell you this, I um and and so is Jeb Bush, and he's somebody I've always looked up to. I thought that were you that thought that you were gonna say him. Yeah, and I I'm not gonna say that uh, I don't look up to him now. I still think he's been a great pioneer for education. However, seeing the way that he became undone, and you know, again, envision this this line of politicians all at the top of their game, and then in comes Trump at the front of the line, just starts smacking them one by one. Yeah. Next, yeah. next. Yeah. Next. And I said, wow, listen, if there's going to be a leader of the free world, it's got to be that guy yeah. because he just made all of these guys his sons. And <laughs> I need that guy. That's Big Daddy. So I, I stuck with Trump after, you know, after the primary. I said, you know what? That's my guy because he's the only guy that's going to be able to sit across the table from somebody and say to any foreign threat that we may have. Nope, not going to happen. And okay. they're, they're going to believe it. All right. So. So we're going to go with we're going to we're going to assume certain things, not the gloss over, not that it's important. But so Trump gets elected right. um, a lot of different policies, a lot of different a lot of different things that um, he does. And we'll get to that in a minute. So it's really building the base and really having a nice run. So I want to say up until 19 late 19, you're basically dancing a jig. And if you want to give some of the specific points you were super happy about it as a conservative that he, I mean, really quick, I believe he was the most conservative president and you may disagree since Reagan, in my opinion, I don't think anybody. Yeah, no, I, I agree him. with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. I think that's one of the reasons I was such a big advocate and still am a big supporter and defender yeah. of the president because it, actions speak louder than words. I don't care that he's orange. I don't care about his hair. I don't care about anything he says. Yeah. I really care about what he does. And the way he governed, the policies that were instituted during the Trump administration, bar none, hands down, were the most conservative policies we've seen in a generation. Yeah, good point. Now, OK. And then so so up until you know, late 19, early 20, he was killing it. The economy was doing well, uh, appointed at that point two Supreme uh, Court justices, which I believe was a huge win for conservatives. Uh, I could mm -hmm. I might, might argue win for America, but yeah, we're going to keep it yeah, cool now. Right. Uh, uh, I respect Rich. And again, we're out a lot to disagree, which is a good thing. Um, obviously, I, I love what he did with the first step step back. I love what he did. Sure. Uh, one of the things that like this gets glossed over is the urban enterprise zones. Like, I don't think people understand that you're, you know, you're going to be able to open up that barber shop because mm -hmm. Rich, you know, sold his other business, bought a building in Plainfield, New Jersey, and now can Hey, you need a barber shop? Great. Why don't you come in? That guy or gal starts cutting hair. Now they start making a few bucks. They invest with their friend who's a financial advisor. So I, that's like actually, I don't know why that wasn't the biggest. Um, he did some great stuff within the Jewish community. He moved the, um, um, the you know, moved the embassy. Uh, has some peace treaties with like UAE and so forth, which like peace in the Middle East actually became a thing. And, and it well, sucks. Be, and it sucks because don't get me wrong. It's hard to look past the brashness. I get that. But there was a lot of good. And I, and I, and I come from, and you can probably can imagine rich, a staunch democratic party, staunch Democrats, 
you know, and like there are a few things that keep me kind of centered. I- I'm becoming more of a libertarian these days. I think I'm gonna grow a longer beard and move to Maine. That's a, <laughs> but that's a that's another discussion for another day. So now let's go to 2020. And 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 so again, we're gonna we're gonna qualify here today. And you can go back to my other podcast. There's arguably 10 things that are uneffable to f with with Trump that we can agree and say, hey, you know what? This was good for the country. So we're going to check that box in the interest of time. Sure. Okay. Now, COVID hits. And I get what he was trying to do. Um, decentralize United States of America Constitution. Because I, I, And also, Rich, respectfully, and it's not a bad thing. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the undertone, the smarter people listening to this. It's, you're starting to weave a constitutional background. Would you agree with that, with your thoughts? You sure. know, Ted, Ted Cruz was one hint. Working yeah. on Lebanon, not a bad thing. I'm saying it's a good thing, but you are. I would it fair to say you're a constitutionalist? Is that fair? Oh, for sure. I I literally read it every day. Not the whole thing, love, but love it, parts it, of it. You got to check yourself, right? And that's the guide. Well, that's so the people that are listening. If you heard Ted Cruz and you know where Rich works, if you didn't paste that together, you got to brush up on your politics. But anyway, so your practice are, uh, constitutionalist. I don't disagree with you. Um, we need to have uh, our best to create a perfect union. So with that being said, though. Um, COVID hits and he, you know, he, I get, I get it. It's a, it's a philosophy. You have 50 governors, they're elected decentralized resources. I'll give you your resources. Uh, Montana at the time was not as bad as New York city. So I actually don't disagree with his approach. However, I, I do thought there might've been either like, you know, like national guidelines or something that just would have been like, and I know there were, I know there were, but and I'm not saying that mandates is a difference, but I felt like his response could have been a little better. Let's start off with where do you think he could have did a little better job in terms of the COVID response from Rich Valdez's perspective? Yeah, well, honestly, I, I look back and I, I look at it and I say, what was lacking? And I think maybe he should have replaced Dr. Fauci. I think leaning on somebody like Dr. Fauci that had such a storied history that was steeped, in my opinion, controversy with people looking back at how he handled the AIDS epidemic and things of that nature. So I think, you know, but I believe Trump is a real fair guy and he also weighed his options. He came into Washington and said, wow, this, these, these um, entrenched bureaucrats like this guy Comey who got involved in the last election, you know, the election he was in, right. And said, you know, that this, there's this whole problem here with Hillary Clinton. We don't need a guy like this. And he dismisses Comey and immediately they start impeaching him. So I think he realized early on, if I shake, uh, if I rock the boat too much and shake things up around here, they're going to come from my neck. So I got to play this cool politically. Yeah. So I think he kept Fauci because Fauci would eventually become the fall guy, although he hasn't. Right. Yeah. They, they want to blame Trump for everything. But Fauci was really at the head of this thing, as, as well as Dr. Burks. So I think he may have added more people and sooner. I think he brought on Dr. Scott Atlas uh, at the tail end of it. I think he could have brought him in a little earlier. So, uh, you know, maybe our good friend, Dr. Kassir. I'm just kidding. Yeah, there you I, go. There you go. <laughs> everybody look good. I think it's important, though, that, you know, we don't look at it this and realize that um, it, I don't think it was a disaster. I think a big part of this was the media making problems for somebody they didn't like. And that's just uh, the reality of it. We have to look at it for what it is. You know, I think the other day, President Biden said, look, folks, uh, this, this is going to take a long time. It's going to be a many dark days ahead. Yeah. And that may be his approach. Yeah. Uh, Trump is a salesman. He's a builder. He's used to, you know, unveiling projects and hyping things up. And again, just because I follow his career and I've always been a fan outside of politics. Yeah. So I can say that, you know, I appreciate his approach and always the best is yet to come trying to paint the rosy picture to show Americans that we have hope. I think Biden's approach, that it's gloomy. Again, different approach. Uh, it's going to be the same outcome. Neither one of them is going to be able to temper the coronavirus with rhetoric. Okay. So now, so, and, and good point. So, so, so you feel like, you know, hey, you did a decent job, areas of opportunity. You could have brought Scott Atlas in a little earlier. Now, I do think, because I, I, I do watch Fox. I, I watch, I watch everything. I watch Fox. Sure. News Max. Me too. I do, I do watch CNN. I can't watch MB- MSNBC. Sorry, Michaela. That's the funniest uh, my one. Knees. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but, but I try to try to look at everything, right? So, so with Scott Atlas, I actually what people didn't understand is he does believe in herd herd immunity, but didn't sure. mean he wanted everybody to get it. So I think I although although some of the stuff with Scott Atlas, I don't agree. I don't like his approach, you know that kind of stuff. But 
He's not an idiot. He knows what he's talking about. Comes from Stanford of, of all places. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think he got a little bit misunderstood. But here's my question, though. Strategically, and I want to kind of now go to strategy now. Trump had his base. You are voting for him no matter what. Like, Rich Valdez is voting for him. Like, he joked around about the Fifth Avenue stuff. Yeah. He's voting. You're, you're voting for him. I felt he pandered to the base too much. I, so, I don't know who, like, Hopix, Hip whoever, like, his strategist is, is like, you got to double down. You got to double down. Conservatives done. Check. Right? Did a lot for the African-American community. We got to get that community up from nine to 13 percent the latin community great south florida like you don't like there was in miami there's places in miami that went red that weren't just cuban they were puerto rican and from yeah, other yeah. places mm -hmm. and, 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 and the, puerto rico played a big uh result in this election because mm -hmm. a lot of puerto ricans left after maria and um and i think that had to do with ironically had to do with him getting florida but anyway because there's so much to unpack so 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 what I'm saying is typically when you're a businessman, you're an entrepreneur, when you got 12 people, right? You're going to have three rock stars. You're going to have four or five middle Michaels and you're going to have three or four people that you're going to have to crap can because they're just not. So in order to get your organization to where it needs to go, you need to move the middle. So, so why did he double down on his base versus maybe going after people like me? I am a, I am a Democrat. I'm a pro business Democrat. Um, there's two things that keep me from being a Republican. One is I am I am pro-choice, respectfully. And number two is I'm very big on LGBTQ plus rights. I'm not saying uh, Republicans aren't, but I'm just saying I found I found a home on the left here, right? So those are the two things that's stopping me from coming on your show, right, Rich? Yeah, I hope you have me anyway. But you get what I'm saying. But everything else, I definitely lean right or libertarian, right? So with that being, I'm just more... The government should be in the business. Of, I think we can agree the government should be in the business of marriage. Just my opinion. I just think and, and taxes. And we should have the, we should have such a small government that when the president is elected, you and I, you and I call each other and laugh because it's meaningless to us. You can leave. Right. You, I think I think we probably agree on those grounds. Right. But what I'm getting at is I'm sorry for talking too long about it, though. What, what, what I'm getting at is, OK, so with with I don't know how to say this. With with Trump, why why didn't he go for me? Why didn't he go for like like he tried to scare me? Like, well, the uh, the the riots are gonna bleed into you know the suburbs. No, they're not, you know. Um, why didn't he go for me? I'm sitting there. I have my hand raised. You know, I'm open to a date. You know, I'm single politically. Why didn't he go? For me? <laughs> why why, why but, didn't he go for me? I would push back on that and say I okay. think he did. Okay, I think okay. the reason that he got more votes than any sitting president in the history of the United States is because guys like you, maybe not you in particular, but yeah. guys like you that said, hey, you know what? I'm not dating anybody politically, and I'm open to a dance with the MAGA movement. There's a lot of people that jumped on the Trump train, not yeah. because of Trump per se, but because they like you. They said, you know what? I'm Italian. I come from an Italian family. Look at what happened in Long Island, both yeah. Suffolk County and Nassau County. Yeah. Those guys were Democrats forever and a day, yep. but all yep. of a sudden yep. they became they didn't stop being Democrats. These are Democrats that believed in America first. These Correct. are Democrats that believed in, in seeing the economy flourish and said, no, we have to say no to gangs like MS-13. Yeah. We have to push out Antifa and all of these other radical elements that are growing on the left unchecked. Yeah. So what happened? I think that did become the base. So in effect, I think President Trump doesn't really he's not he is the de facto leader of the Republican Party. But he's really the leader of the MAGA party or the Patriot party or whatever you want to call it, yeah. because it's a mixed bag. Many I would bet you if you ask people who were in this MAGA movement, hey, listen, who did you vote for before Trump? I bet you 60 percent of them would say Obama. Yeah, good point. And it's interesting enough is if you really follow politics, um, I believe my views and definitely Rich's views are traditional. Let me look this up. Traditional. Democrat beliefs, not Democrat beliefs. Yeah, so traditional Democrat. Yeah, so uh -huh. so 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 that's why sometimes it gets conflated. All right, so now I want to talk about where where the conservatives are going. So I don't want to make this all about Trump. We, we all talk sure. about him enough. Uh, we have a new president, new administration. You know, we're doing some new things. So let's. I want to first talk about. So I want to get your feel. And it's funny because I always think of you once in a while. And and I want to run some names by you. I want to see where you land. Okay. Ben Shapiro, right? So I do watch a show. He wasn't a Trump guy in 16. 
he, he, but then he liked his conservative values, pushed him in 2020. I kind of feel he's hedging a little bit, you know, because he's running a business. I get it. Uh, but wh- where do you land on Ben Shapiro as a, as a conservative thought leader? I think he's terrific. Okay. How about Candace Owens? Love her. Okay. So, these, so, so to me, these are some of the newer faces. What do you think of Dave Rubin? Dave Rubin, smart guy, really smart guy. He's okay. um, uh, talked to him for about 30 seconds once, uh, but right before I put him on with Levin. And he, um, really brilliant guy. I, I love the fact that he's a, he's a um, Canadian. He's not yeah. American. Yeah. He, he was a radical leftist on a show that attacked me some years ago. He used the to Young Turks, that's right. Jer- Jersey Bay show. Yeah. So, you know, those guys, they took some shots at me and uh, it was cool to see somebody from Dave Rubin and from that crew uh, actually wake up and say, you know what? Wow. There's a whole lot more to life when you actually think beyond the surface. And uh, I think he brings a, a lot of insight to the national conversation. Now, now this may, you may differ, but about Joe Rogan, what are your thoughts on his? I, I know he's not a political thought leader, but just in terms yeah, of. I don't really follow him too much, but I, the, the episodes that I've seen, I, he's a terrific broadcaster. I mean, hands down, he's got one of the best podcasts out there, at least by numbers. Yeah, he's true. Killer. So, so now the, the part of the reason why I wanted John, many reasons, but the main reason, where does the conservative party go now? Does it splinter off constitutional party, Trump Valdez 2024? Um, mm-hmm. Does it does it just does it unify, retrench and come in w- one voice? Uh, and this is big I'm because this is going to be something that's going to be played four years from now. And you're not going to be on and you're either going to be super right or you're going to be super wrong. But either way, I'd love yeah. to hear it. Where did it cut? Where well, does I it think, where, Yeah, I think the deal is like this in 2010, which is now 11 years ago. In 2010, we saw the Tea Party yeah. and there was the emergence of the Tea Party yeah. and they had gotten all of this, this gravitas and they brought people and these are, it's the same crew. It's yeah. your libertarians, your constitutionalists, the people that are fed up. I've had yeah. enough. I'm a Democrat. I drive trucks, but you know what? I can't allow this to happen to my country anymore. Yeah. And, and they all got together and they ousted a bunch of people from Congress and they made, they made their, they made their move. Now, in recent years, we've seen the same thing. Some call it the Tea Party of the left. You've got the squad, AOC, all out crazy, her crew. Now, these people come in and they do their thing to radicalize the Democrat Party, and they've been yeah. extremely successful. They're yeah. no longer the fringe. They make up a good amount of the Democrat Party and Correct. are controlling policymaking. Now, Trump comes in with, again, with the same disenfranchised people, similar to the Obama model of people that were disenfranchised, and everybody and their mother came out and said, we're voting for Obama because this Correct. is the change we want. Same thing happened with Trump. He was the same yeah. thing, just in a different direction. Correct. And people went with that. And I think it likely would have happened again. And it was an extremely close election. So to discount anything, I think would be foolish. But all that being said, the uh, you still there, Tom? Yeah. You got me? OK, cool. I, I had a little flash on my side. Anyway, awesome. the to move forward, I think we're going to do what we've always done. You know, so you always have these rebounds and these peaks and valleys in politics. So now we're going into now the battle becomes for the House. I think we have to retake the House. We have to eliminate Nancy Pelosi's power. We saw 10 Republicans, very diverse ones, yeah. get elected in this last um, House election. So I think we're going to see more of that. I'm hopeful that Trump will be a part of that and continue to move that forward because conservatism has always been here since Reagan, since before Goldwater. It, and it's going to be here. There's always going to be that group. And to me, the battle is it's a culture war over how many conservatives do we produce in life and and do we get them to become conservative younger? So a lot of people, it takes them to have a couple of kids before they go, oh, man, I probably want to send my kids to Catholic school or I want to do this or I want to do that because I don't want my kids to grow up in that area. I'm going to move to the suburbs. Yeah. And, you know, some people choose not to have kids and they stay in the city and they promote other agendas. So I think and all of that stuff, honestly, I, it becomes a debate that occurs in the classroom. And it used to be just on university campuses, but now that conversation is happening earlier and earlier to the point where you now have, you know, kids that are in kindergarten learning very controversial topics like the 1619 Project and other things. So I think this is a real culture war. It's an information war in many ways, and we have to get into that fight at that level. So we're going to see this play out in a lot of ways, but I think conservatives are in for the long haul. I think we're going to continue to see gains with conservatives. The problem I think that we face, the biggest challenge is the Republicans that don't embrace embrace conservatism, that embrace the Washington culture of elitism, of a ruling class, uh, where, you know, Mitch McConnell is very chummy and buddy buddy with Chuck Schumer and yeah. likewise with Joe Biden. Yeah. And it's this old boys network 
where it's like, hey, it's a bunch of rich old white guys that have served in Washington for 30 plus years. And that is the political class that I think we need to break, not because they're old, not because they're white, but because they're swamp creatures from Washington, D.C. That's a great point. So and I think we would agree that um, maybe maybe even net net. There was somewhat of a, a red wave, right? Because you have the House that made some major gains towards red, which I think there's a chance of it next go around losing the House. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to discount Georgia, but that was only two seats. And you know, Georgia's a, a interesting state. It's a migrating it's a real state. Battleground. It's cha- yeah. So 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 like it's now a battleground, right? So like um, so you you know, so but like so you can't be like, well, you know, they got the house, they got the senate. Well, it's not that simple. Like you got two seats and that was enough to tip it, but there's still a lot of red in 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 the in in, in the Senate. You have a lot of um uh, red in the house. I think once that flips red, which it will, is my prediction, um, then you're really gonna get a battle. I I I don't super love, and like, I'm gonna get shit for this. I don't super love that all three are blue right now. I, I just don't. I just I I don't love it because there's certain things I don't ag- disagree with. I don't want to pay more in taxes, um, and there's certain things. But anyway, we'll get to that in a second. So so the, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, so he got 74 million votes, right? At least 74 million votes. And to be candid, <clears throat> I think those votes were for him. I, I don't think it was just, you know, hey, I'm Republican. Hey, I'm right. for Trump. Right. And he's got he's got the ball right now. Whether we like it or not, he's got the ball. What does he do with that ball? Does he carve out a subset conservative Tea Party constitutional party? Does he start a third party? Because he has the infrastructure and the business acumen for it. Uh, maybe pick up some of those libertarians. You know, g- give me what Rich Valdez, he calls, he calls it Rich Valdez. You're his, your new Ho picks. What does he do next? Yeah, I think my advice would be, Mr. President, yes, you could start a new third party, but I think it gives us way much more of an obstacle. We have to go uphill with that. Let's do what you're good at and let's do a corporate takeover. Let's take over the Republican Party spit out the ones we don't want, keep the ones we do, backfill with real patriots that are going to do the right thing, that are going to embrace uh, Americanism more than anything, and move forward that way. It's the easiest thing to do, I think. Maybe it's not. Some might argue and say, no, you have too many uh, elected officials that have been voted into the party structure. Uh, Rona McDaniel was reelected as, as chair yeah. of the party. She yeah. was very supportive of Trump, but then she wasn't. But she was, so these could be obstacles that are... Uh, that that's the pushback that I would I may get. So I think if if that has to be looked at, and if it looks like the the past the path of least resistance is taking over the Republican Party in a corporate takeover, then great. If not, then crush them by yeah. doing your own thing. And that's likely I would think that's probably Trump's uh, his inclination is to do that as well as probably get heavy into media, TV, social media, maybe radio whatever it it be, but different mediums so that we can totally reject uh, CNN. We can totally reject MSNBC. And these are organizations that are flailing to begin with. They uh, they don't make money. They exist for the sake of spreading a message because CNN has been in the in the red for a very long time to the point where AT&T is looking to dump it. Yeah. And I know um, I know with with Fox. Right. And and I know there's like almost like a uh different lines you look at like foxnews.com and it's actually you can check it go online there's different organizations it's not as right as you think in terms of you know the website then you know i got tucker um um oh god it's, 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 my, my girlfriend loves your show um the blonde woman what is her name again after after oh, tucker shannon bream oh laura ingram laura ingram ingram angle yeah so so you got some like opinion politics there that you know have been pro-trump um, I, I like Brett Bear too. I, I do. I do watch a lot of the shows. Um, In but, my opinion, what, what, yeah. it's not about it's, Fox being perfect, yeah. but it's probably better than all of the other ones. I, I do like. I do like a lot of the angles that they offer. But so interesting enough is that there's a war within a war because Trump is pretty pissed at Fox right now because he thinks the collective, not an individual, he thinks the collective kind of bailed on him. And I know, like you may, I know, like I'm hitting home and how you answer because it's your home. But 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 some people felt that um, uh, Fox kind of bailed on him a little bit and he even bit, said it, too. But what, what are your thoughts on that? I think I wouldn't look at it that way. I, I think the president's always um, what I've observed, always said, 
please cover me fairly. Yeah. That's really always been his request. Just be fair. Yeah. And I think when people are not fair, he'll call them out for not being fair. I don't think he wants them to be favorable. I think he just says, wow, what happened to this? You know, we have to remember what was the purpose for Fox to exist? Why did why did Roger Ailes create this thing? It yeah. was because we he realized there's a vacuum here. People want to hear about America. They want to hear about um, analysis and opinion that is right of center. And there was a need for it. And obviously they, they're there. They're losing. They're bleeding out a little bit now with other competitors like OAN and Newsmax stepping in. So it's creating a competitive marketplace, being a free market type of guy. I appreciate that stuff. That's why I'm here with New Theory. I love it. More media is better. All right. So, so to conclude, um, give us some of your predictions, 2024. Who are some of the names that are going to pop up? I think you're going to see Josh Hawley and Nikki Haley. Um, you may see a, uh, a draft movement for Ron DeSantis, who, in my opinion, will probably be the best one hands down. Wow, that's a, a ball. That's a ball. I like that. Career. That's balls right there. Mark Rich's words. Keep but, going. Yeah, uh, I, I think he would be great. Uh, again, he's already said he won't do it because he's got much more work to do in Florida. But again, you never know if people will twist his arm and he can get into the race. So I think you're going to see some of that. A lot of people are making predictions about Trump and Trump family members. Um, I, I don't see that one yet. I mean, obviously, if Trump says, hey, I'm running, I think people are going to clear the field because he's got more of a shot than anybody else of winning. Yeah. And and the experience of going against Biden and any any pitfalls that were missed this time, he's going to be prepared for them a second time around. But I really don't think that's the case. Four years is a long time for him to wait. I think he could do way more starting a media empire, going into different things, doing continuing the rally movement. Trump, in my opinion, once he's done with his vacation of coming back to uh, civilian life, I think he's going to be way more of a threat to the Democrat Party as a private citizen yeah. than he ever was as a president. That's, that, that's great. So, Rich, you got a few, you wear a few different hats. How can we find you? What show we should watch you on? Uh, let sure. our audience know yeah. about you. Anytime, man. I'm on every social media at Rich Valdez with an S. Rich Valdez with an S. And uh, you can get me on the radio. You can get me on podcasts. If you can download the This Is America podcast, subscribe. That's awesome. We're doing really well. We constantly chart in the top 200 listen, most listened to podcasts on the Apple News Politics chart. Oh, wow. Which is a really thrill for that's me. Hard to, that's, a hard nut, that's a hard nut to crack, guys. Yeah, it's hard to stay in there. I mean, yeah. a couple of times I got into the top 100. Uh, my oh, peak wow. was number 25, and I'm super proud of that. So, um, yeah, give it a give it a whirl, if you will. Give us a shot. I we do three episodes every week, uh, 30 minutes, 10 minutes per segment, three different topics. We try to hit hard with the analysis, the opinion, the passion, and then we keep it moving. Love it. Uh, we'll put link uh, links below. Rich, thank you for being on the theory podcast. You got it, brother. Good to see you, Tom. Thanks to new theory. Same here, brother.